Welcome back to Craft and Cocktails. I'm your host, Chris Werner. Today, we're hanging out with Andrew Schmedeke. And now we're going to do a deep dive into one of his recent live stream projects. Okay, so the most recent project for Pixel Playhouse was the importance of being earnest. The technological hurdles to, to do this were, were pretty numerous and the success is pretty impressive. It's, it's literally the next version of where things are going. You are one of the people taking us there. So, uh, man, tell us how. Tell us how this all worked. Absolutely. So what we've got, and I've actually got a quick little system rise to guide us through it, is a blend of audio and video feeds coming to me at a central location where I went ahead and cut everything together in open broadcast software, or OBS as it's abbreviated to, which is just a digital streaming software. We can go ahead and take either take audio and video and other assets and cut them together into a layout like what you're seeing right now. I'm actually piping an OBS scene into my Zoom call to go ahead and show you how this workflow works. And you can see, at least on our system riser, that we had a multitude of different of different feeds that had to go ahead and mix together to get to one actual centralized broadcast of nine different remote performers sending their audio and their video over Zoom, over Skype, and over an ISDN called CleanFeed to go ahead and cut everything together into one centralized performance. Is every performer location, location using all three of those pieces of technology? Is everyone logged into Zoom, Skype, and CleanFeed? About seven of the, sorry, six of the performers had both their audio and their video feeds coming through Skype, and that was just fine for them. We're able to use a protocol called NewTek NDI, which stands for Network Device Interface, which is really just a way to pipe video from one software to another piece of software on your computer. So we would go ahead and take the Skype feed, pipe that over into OBS, and we were able to at least drop them in anywhere we wanted to on, on screen. Unfortunately, there is some issues with Skype's video quality. It'll go ahead and rubber band significantly, which causes of drastic decay in video quality for people with low tier internets. And so these two of our performers had to hop onto a Zoom call, which is a bit more forgiving in terms of video resolution. And they, we, we went ahead and captured their uh, video on an external television display hooked up to our streaming computer as a display capture, piped that into OBS and still cut them in so it looked like they were acting alongside their peers. Meanwhile, we had our sound designer as well as sound engineer on QLab piping in QLab sound effects through Loopback, a Mac piece of software that would then take uh, audio outputs and put it into a mic input, as well as our pianist playing live piano and just the entire show into an ISDN, also known as a integrated services digital network called CleanFeed, which is a very high fidelity audio capture program that was then sent out as a secondary audio capture that we put into OBS. And so where was the pianist? Where is that person? Our pianist was playing in her own home, socially distancing. And the, the sound designer in front of QLab? Same thing. So no one was in the same room except for our two, our four leads. We were doing the importance of being earnest. So our Aljon and Cecily were in the same room as well as our Jack and our Gwendolyn. Unfortunately, we were lucky to have cast two couples. So they were actually sheltered in place together because they were actually dating in real life. This is so cool. Okay, so uh, streaming this, uh, this is live as a one-off. This is recorded and played back. What, what do you give to the audience? So this event was streamed live once and then recorded for a video on demand on Twitch, which means you're able to watch it for at least 60 days after the initial broadcast. But the whole benefit to doing it live is that we're actually able to interact with our chat. And I can show you some examples here as we're rolling through a slideshow of various images. Because Twitch and streaming is so dependent upon actually actively engaging with, with an audience who could watch anything they want to, there are literally thousands of channels on Twitch. Why would they tune into us making theater on a Saturday night? We've tried to find ways to actually interact with and engage with our audiences in a way that's going to keep them excited about watching theater on a Saturday night. And so we framed it around the entire framing device of let's have a sipping game where you make some tea because we're watching British drama. Our butler here, played by Harrison Maloney, would actually go ahead and take us our intermissions to go ahead and talk to them and interact with the chat. You can actually see an overlay here where we're featuring actual questions with the chat so that our actors can go ahead and in character answer questions from them and keep them engaged as participants in the narrative, less so just obs observational people. I went ahead and built out storyboards of all the scenes based off of long six hours of meetings with our director, Jay Lee, to figure out, okay, he, would, he had an idea of how to stage each scene, and we talk about, okay, on what line are we going to go ahead and take a cut to focus on the pertinent people? Because when you're in a nine-person drama where you've got this many feeds on, on screen, it's difficult to actually have a personal connection with someone when they occupy such a small amount of real estate. So we identified ways to try and figure out, okay, who's pertinent in this line of this conversation? How can we cut to a two-shot of just two actors after we establish where everyone was in space with a master shot like a four-shot, for instance? And what you're seeing in the slideshow here 
is what I built in OBS, which is placeholder scenes of where those camera feeds might be, and then the actual finished product, what would live on Twitch. And so, at least in the rehearsal process, we were able to rehearse with the actors, screen sharing an OBS display, so they could figure out, okay, where are we in space? How can we maintain relative human scale so we look like we're actually the same size as one another in the same room? by how close we stand to the camera, as well as where they should look. That way they were comfortable enough during the actual live stream to not need to check the camera, check where they stood as often. They'd already gotten it in their bones to be able to act alone, but with one another remotely. And did this, uh, did the rehearsal process take more time, less time? Is the ability to explore in an actor's own time helpful for the rehearsal process, or did you end up finding a, a big slowdown? Honestly, for a three-act drama that took about the entire broadcast about three hours long, we built it all in about three weeks, which is pretty ludicrous even to try and bring that to stage on its own without having to digitize it all and deal with camera. We sort of just burned through it as fast as we could to get something out there and actually produce something in a way that was engaging and that rewarded us. A lot of the actors you see here are by coastal. We had performers in New York City and Los Angeles, but there are also a lot of people who are friends. And our goal as a production team was find a way to go ahead and employ our friends, make sure they're paid, and also give them a platform and a place to go ahead and share what they love to do when we can't actually gather in person. It just so happened that it also gave me a chance to go ahead and investigate new ways to do what I love to do, which is use technology to go ahead and find new ways to present live performance. Well, let's speak, um, you mentioned the backgrounds. Let's talk about the, the various departments that would be involved. How was scenery handled? Who handled it? How about costumes? Um, how did you handle lighting things? We actually met the production team and set up remote consults with each of our cast members. It was about two and a half hours altogether as we talked them through how to light themselves in their own home, how to use what they have available to, to give themselves the best production value without investing a ton of time, money and resources. Uh, we would have had an initial consult for about half an hour to talk about, okay, how do you set up your camera to get it to the actual camera lens at your eye line so you're not acting up or down the camera, looking at your nostrils or looking down your shirt, for instance. And we also started talking to figure out, okay, what do you have in terms of actual lights in your own home? I oftentimes would recommend people take a floor lamp, put one camera right, one camera left, and if they had different color temperatures, wrap one in a semi-translucent scarf just to warm it up or something. It was all very DIY, how can we find ways to actually make give you production value with the tools you have in your own home costumes were partially shipped in partially not one of the most fun things was shun heckle our props designer actually had to find, identify the most important hand props to go ahead and give to our our performers so for instance there's a key cigarette case that needs to go ahead and be handed from a butler to algernon to jack and so three copies of the cigarette case made their way to everyone's homes and we had actual rehearsal calls of how to do handoffs with you reaching off frame to grab something, then bring it back at the same time someone reaches to hand you something else. Can we uh, dive into the technical for a moment? Can you show us what the OBS looks like or what, um, in general, what maybe OBS is? I know you're currently not in the OBS show file since you're streaming to us, but can you? Uh... I absolutely can be. I mean, the, fortunately, the benefit to OBS is that your shows are all loaded at the same time. So let's give you an example of what things look like when I'm in OBS right now for this. What we have on the left side is a variety of scenes that are your various camera layouts and layouts of your video assets and attributes. So you can see next to them, I have my sources, which is a microphone or audio capture that shows that I'm recording right now to OBS with my current microphone input. My live webcam input is a video capture. And then a carousel of image stills that was meant to be a backdrop for what I share with you on a Zoom call. But if you want to take a look at our preview show file, it's still saved here in OBS and it's a big old file, but I can give you a rundown of what the actual show file looked like on our end. And I built it largely in the same way that I would build a theatrical show file for QLab or for the EOS platform. What we have are reference slides, which are the actual camera inputs and captures of each of our performers, where we have, at least you can see here, this is our Gwendolyn capture and it's referencing a Skype ID, which is their guest, their account on Skype. So it's always the same person in the same frame. And on top of that, we've also got our Q list, which comes down here with Q1, which is our camera check, which was our quick off-screen, let's make sure everyone's cameras are active, they're engaged, make sure we're capturing audio properly. And then I could just go ahead and arrow key down through all the cues in the show. And if I were to drag this out and give you a better example for how many there are, there's a good 300 odd camera takes as we go through every scene and let me pull this out of the show for all queued out and marked in my script. So I was running the show while taking these cues on specific lines 
that would then bring us into intermission graphics, things like this. One of the fun tricks about all this is that if we're going to look at our audio captures, NDI also pipes in a sound capture of every performer, but it's only active while they're on screen. And it also happens to be a sound capture of the entire Skype call. So if you happen to leave all of these active at the same time, like for instance, in our camera test, you can see that I've got all of these extra audio mixes all muted because it would just be the same Skype call repeated nine times. And that's right. like a company to listen to. Instead, what we did for our audio capture was just capturing my local laptop's audio output. And so everything that I hear on my laptop would be sent out to our team. And one of the neat tricks, at least about Skype, is that when you're talking to someone on video chat, you don't hear yourself come back through your own audio. So I could talk to our actors, call them into the show, for instance, and say, we're going to go live in five, four, three, two, one, and then our pianist can start playing, the audio capture from clean feed starts to come in, and I'm able to at least talk them through what the nature of the show is as we take our cues. This One of the awesome. other idiosyncrasies of sound and video calling is that oftentimes a video call program will go ahead and duck all speakers who are not active speakers. That means if I'm talking, your microphone is ducked down and you probably can't talk over me. And that's going to help us from having three people talk at the same time and chaos happening. The problem is that that will not be successful if you're trying to underscore the piano, for instance, like most of our show was. So how do you bring in live piano and sound effects over top of dialogue? And that's where our clean feed setup kind of came in. So I can show you a quick guide to what a clean feed room looks like. And clean feed is an ISDN, which means it's high fidelity, not ducking audio. And I got your password, totally got your password. Right. Eat and not. in the pro version, you can even go ahead and mix it plus or minus dB. Okay. Remotely while broadcasting. So we had our PMS and our sound designer sitting in a clean feed room like this, piping their sound effects and their audio in. I captured that on a second audio capture. So the actors were not even in the same audio room as the sound effects. So how do you act when you've got a sound effect meant to cue a line? In the same way that I was able to count them into shows, I could go ahead and say, the tea kettle's going, and they can respond to a kettle on screen. Okay, so let's talk about latency. How did you, how much latency did you find and in which pieces of technology and how did you offset for it? So we try to minimize latency by at least keeping everyone on the same platform. All of our actors were at least acting through audio together on the Skype call, so they could at least respond to the respond as quickly as they got as they heard a cue line from their peers. And then we try to minimize the rest of latency. For instance, this led this was me calling the show because if I were to go ahead and be a stage manager, we'd call a go to a remote operator based off of what I hear from someone. We can presume it's maybe a half second or less, even with the ideal situations of someone giving a cue line to me over Skype. Once I call the go, someone's got to respond to that, and then take a cue on their end, and we introduce up to a second of latency. And so we found the best way to run the show was the sound designer taking his own cues, me taking my own camera cues, and trying to at least minimize point-to-point -point contact. And largely that led us to have a relatively tight show, especially when it came to overlapping lines, as well as camera cuts, just by responding quickly and intuitively and knowing when to take our own cues. We know that you're leading the charge. Super excited about that. Um, we know that there's a ton of stuff in your head right now um, that you're not going to tell us. But where's this going? What, what is next, right? The version that you guys did is, is very cool. It's, it's crude. Um, it's leaps and bounds ahead of what most are doing. So where does this go in a big market consumable way? How do we, what does it look like when we dump a pile of cash behind it? What's gonna be next? I think when we're able to go ahead and have the resources to do production design for nine different setups, that's when it starts to get much better. Because the crude thing is that we're looking at what people can do with the lights in their own home, in their own apartments. And there's no resources for production value in this scale of project, especially when there's limited ROI on what you can do for a free streaming platform. Largely what we're trying to do here is at least provide opportunities for our performers, but we're not making a ton of money back from people, the people who watch this for free on Twitch. And so if there is ever a way to monetize this or at least drive in the actual money from a production company, for instance, it's throwing a green screen on someone's backdrop as opposed to actually having what they have happen to have behind them. It's bringing an actual quality production, oh, sorry, production quality lighting as a way to go ahead and illuminate people with actual consistency as opposed to what they happen to have in their own home. And it's also bringing in a higher quality camera. I think it's actually building studios for people in their own homes in a way that they can still interface with this workflow to do live performance. Was the audience savvy enough to know that that was cool? Like that you had established the rules, they're in different screens and the Brady Bunch squares and one person walked from a square to another square. Did they react? That, that is the absolute benefit to actually having live chat to a Twitch stream because you can watch the audience respond to what you did right in real time. And the first time we had an actor walk into someone else's frame and we broke the rules of each person being in their own frame, 
they went wild. It was phenomenal. And fortunately, chat's still there on the video on demand. If we if you're able to go ahead and watch this on Pixel Playhouse's Twitch channel, you can actually follow along live with some of the interactive things we did to engage with them, as well as their responses to what we were doing as it actually happened and unfolded. This is all so cool. Um, so we are sadly not the first people um, to speak with you about this. So you've been writing about it. You've been sharing this as like an advocate for keeping us all working and pushing entertainment forward. So the folks that are looking at us on a little tiny screen can get more information where? So I've been writing about this on a series of uh, tools for live streaming, live performance articles on my website, www.schmedekeylightingdesign.com. That was a poor marketing choice when I chose that URL. But it's, I'm, at least, I'm a huge advocate for this because I want us to go at least get to a point where we can create and innovate new things together. Yes, this was really cool because we were one of the first people to think about how do you reframe people, how do you use eye lines across different frames to go ahead and create the illusion of live performance in the same digital space. But we've seen how raw it looks. It's still not perfect. I and mean, we can, there's so much room to go to keep on expanding on this in ways that I haven't thought of. And I don't want to be the only person who's actually trying to innovate on this. I think there's room for our line designers out there, for our video designers, for anyone who wants to take the time to pivot into new models to support the creation of live art in a way that's going to keep people entertained and keep our performers actually out there on, talking to their audiences. The but innovation has been fast. Like, I keep talking about this when sitting in front of these Zoom calls, but when we tuned in at the beginning of this pandemic to watch late night television, it was rough. And and it is not perfect right now, but it's comfortable. They found a stride and they did it in this unbelievably fast period of time, which is remarkable. It's pretty fantastic. I mean, it's inspiring to see all the ways people are finding new ways to use digital media to connect with their audiences. People still want to tell stories. They still want to connect to their audiences. They still want to connect to each other. And we have the tools to do that. We already had them when we could see each other in person, but now we're able to at least rely on them and utilize them in different ways to create new ways, to at least create the new form of storytelling while we're socially distant. And that's so cool to think about. Most of us are here because we love storytelling. So um, we're all appreciative that you are just forging a path for those of us that want to do more work instead of just sitting at home. Join us for part three. We'll grill Andrew with some questions, including some from you, the followers of Limelight Wired and one from a previous guest. Stick around, and we'll tell you who's coming up next week.